We take it for granted that we can sit outside like this in the dusk without having to put up protection against mosquitoes. When I came back to Wat Meta after all those years in Thailand, it was something that was hard to get used to, because over there, this is the time of evening when the mosquitoes are out. And it's not just a matter of not liking the feel of the mosquito bite, but the mosquitoes that carry malaria come out at this time of day, too. So you have to be careful. You have to be heedful. And even though it may sound like you're worried, still the fact that you're heedful reduces the worry. I remember reading an account one time of someone who had sought out a Jan Sao when he was staying in a jungle in the Northeast. And he reported on how he was impressed. When Jan Sao had lived for many months at this one spot. It was a well-known malarial jungle. Other people had gotten malaria, but a Jan Sao hadn't. And he didn't attribute it to any special magical powers on a Jan Sao's part. that John Sound knew how to look after himself. He knew the times to stay in his mosquito net and the times when he could go out, what water he could drink. It turns out malaria can be transmitted through water, where mosquitoes lay their eggs. So he's always boiled all his water. He took all the necessary precautions, and as a result he didn't have to worry. And this didn't, of course, rule out the possibility that he could get malaria, but it certainly lessened the possibility. The more heedful you are, the less you have to worry about. The same with eating lettuce. You don't eat lettuce in Thailand. There's no way that it's going to be clean. No matter how much you scrub it, there's always a possibility that night soil can be in the pores at the bottom of the leaves. And you just take it for granted. Lettuce is something you don't eat. Of course, nowadays they have hydroponic lettuce, which you can eat, but back in the days when I was there, it was just ruled out. Crab meat was also something you couldn't eat. Nobody in Thailand would buy live crabs, which meant that the crabs had been dead before they bought them, so who knows how long the meat could easily spoil. So these were things you just took for granted. You were careful. You avoided obvious dangers. That gave you less to worry about. And less to regret, in case you did come down with a disease. You knew that you had done everything you could. But it was going to happen. It wasn't going to happen because you were careless. You probably know that story of the Shackleton expedition. The plan was to land on one coast of Antarctica, walk across the continent, and get picked up on the other coast. Well, they never even made it to the first coast. The ship was locked in ice. The ice was going to crush it. They had to get off the ship and row in their little dinghies away from the coast and ultimately across the ocean. And they all made it alive. And the secret was that Shackleton impressed on his sailors the fact that if you try your best, if you know what needs to be done and you do what needs to be done, and you die anyhow, you die without regret. If it's when you know what needs to be done and you don't do it and you die, you, there's always that possibility. Well, maybe if only I had, had done what I should have done. So do what needs to be done, and that minimizes your worry, minimizes your regret. Of course, thinking about a John Sao living in the forest, the reason to respect him is not simply because he knew how to live in the forest and not get malaria. He realized there were other dangers beyond malaria, the dangers of a mind out of control.
those who were, did what the Buddha said. That was back in the time when they were just beginning to rediscover a lot of the texts. There was a new Vinaya guide that came out, and in one of the editions, tacked on the end, was a translation of some passages on the ascetic practices, the Tudanga practices. And although the monks in the city, the scholars who had found the text and translated it, were occasionally practicing these practices, and John Sao took it really seriously. After all, the Buddha said, go into the forest, live a life of seclusion. So that's what he did. He devoted his life to the Buddha's instructions on how to find true safety. And we pick up this same principle in a John, John Sao student, a John Mun, the practice of the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. Realize that the people who have gone before us have found that this is how you find true safety. You don't redesign the Dharma just to make it popular. These are the Buddha's instructions. He said there are dangers. This is how you avoid the dangers. And so the wise policy, even though you may not know that the Dharma is true, but it makes sense. Both in pointing out the dangers and in pointing out the ways to avoid the dangers. And pointing out the dangers is that we could get reborn. It could be based on our actions. As we come to the practice, we don't know this for sure, but it's a wise hypothesis to take on as your working hypothesis. As the Buddha pointed out many times, if you take on a hypothesis that says everything is beyond your power, You're cutting off any possibility that you could learn, that you could develop a skill. So even though you don't know that there's rebirth, and you don't know that karma is going to affect rebirth, it's wise to take that on as a working hypothesis. You can't just say, well, I don't know, and leave it at that. Because every time you act, you're making a calculation. The effort that goes into this action, is it going to be worth it in terms of the results I'm going to get, then you have to make up your mind. Are you going to calculate the results only in this lifetime, or are you going to take into consideration the possibility that they could lead into future lifetimes? So you can't just say, I don't know, and leave it at that. You're going to make an assumption one way or the other. And as the Buddha said, if you assume that your actions will have consequences leading not only in this lifetime, but others, and that the consequences could be dire if you're unskillful, and very good if you're skillful. You're bound to act in more skillful ways, and be a lot more careful in your actions. You have a basis for deciding what should and should not be done, and that, the Buddha said, gives you protection. Even if it turns out that the assumption is wrong, at least you've behaved in a good way, in an honorable way. And there's a sense of self-worth that goes with that, right here in the present moment. And if it turns out the assumption is true, well, then you benefit it both ways. So as the Buddha said, the basis of all skillful actions is heedfulness. We're not skillful because we're innately good. At the same time, though, the Buddha never said that we're innately bad. The mind is capable of all kinds of things. The problem is that it's very quick to change. So you want to develop your powers of mindfulness and alertness. You, you want to develop your discernment. So you can see what's a good course of action, and you remember to stick with it. You might say Buddhism is a 
religion of heedfulness. You're not hoping to place your trust on some outside power to come and do everything for you. You're starting with the assumption that true happiness can be found through human actions, and that happiness is going to be well worth all whatever effort goes into the path. Those are good assumptions to make. You see other teachings that say human beings are incapable of doing this, they have to wait for somebody else to come and help them. But if that someone else is the creator of the universe, well, just look at the universe. Someone who create people born blind, born crippled. Is that someone you want to trust? And as the Buddha said, if you take a creator god, as your basic assumption, then you end up falling into a path of non-action. In other words, there's really nothing you can do. The Creator God is the one who's determined everything. So you're left helpless and you're left unprotected. So it's through heedfulness that you're protected. So heedfulness, even though it's a type of fear, it's the opposite of worry. It's a confident kind of fear. It recognizes dangers, but also recognizes that there's a way to avoid those dangers and gives you motivation for working on your skills. So even though it turns out that we will die at some point, if you've worked on your skills, you can die without regret. Because you find that they carry you through. These are the things that you're really going to need at that point. So many activities we engage in in the course of our daily lives. They're not going to be helpful at all at that point. But the skills of keeping the mind under control, developing your mindfulness, developing your alertness, developing your ardency, your discernment, these are precisely what you're going to need. And of course, they don't show their benefits only then, as you go through daily life. These qualities based on heedfulness. Or what is going to see you through. After all, the five strengths, the five faculties, the Buddha says, are all based on heedfulness. So as we take precautions as we go through daily life, it's not a matter of worry and fear. It's strength, protection, confidence, lack of regret. All of which are good qualities to nurture in our hearts and minds.